Listen, um, I'm going to whiz through this pretty quickly because we've got a big night ahead. That's not working, so we do this. So tonight we have a slightly different arrangement here, but uh, essentially we've got this layout. We're going to do a quick uh, association news as we do every month. Uh, we're at the uh, UN Youth Space Summit on Thursday, which is a lot on Sunday, which is pretty exciting. We've got our feature speaker, Tim Parsons, here, and we'll introduce him very shortly. And we've also got some extra uh, special guests here from Project X. So um, there'll be a lie detector and uh, some beauty at the doors you leave tonight. And in case you uh, start a souvenir or anything, we're going to take a quick break in the middle, and then we're going to come back with... Uh, New Space News with Angelo and Michael, and then a plan to science update with Andrew, who's still grieving for Cassini, so it would be nice to Andrew, because he's uh, invested a lot of emotion in that. Um, quickly, very quickly, um, I was, uh, myself and myself, a couple of people were at this, uh, we talked about the review of the space activities in Australia, the government's run, they launched it in... Uh, in July, and it's going to be before back to government in April, in March of 2018. A bunch of written submissions provided, including from myself on behalf of the association. They then followed up with these roundtable discussions, which uh, I was out on this on Monday uh, in Melbourne, 2007. The idea of this is to work out what the hell we're going to do and what we're, we're going to do it. Another study. Um, this was the kind of event. These are some of the people that were there. Oh, actually, Andrew, you there? Okay. Um, are you there too? Of course. So, there you go. So, I'm not going to go through any detail on this, give you a bit of a sense of what it was. It did feel a lot like an episode of the Utopia, some stages, anyway. Um, what they did is they got a bit of input from all the people in the audience, uh, talked about different issues and different subjects that did everyone's heart. That was the one I worked on, actually, and There you go. I'll photograph them all. So, this was, uh, they had this, Imagine different parts of the room had these butcher paper and everyone got to write down on the, uh, on poster notes and figure out there what was important to them. They then distilled it down to three key items. Um, so I'm not going to go through all the detail of these. Maybe we'll make these available, um, uh, at another stage. We just don't have time tonight. Talk about partnerships and funding, uh, infrastructure, research, industry, uh, and university and educational interface, and that sort of thing, what the issues were. Um, that is, that is the number, that is. Um, so yeah, so these are quite good, uh, little points here. Once again, I don't know the process of taking all this stuff from our meeting and all the other ones that went on around Australia, taking it back and then having it being part of the report or the review. I don't know. You know. At least we got to vent our spleen a little bit, and um, it was actually a very positive and constructive discussion. Got some new good contacts, so we might have some good speakers coming up as well. Uh, there's a lot of talk about the Australian Space Agency um, being a single point of contact and the coordination of all the activities that are happening around the country, and obviously speaking as a voice for Australia internationally. So um, that was well understood, I think, by the conventions there. Um, so. Topics about uh, coordination, regulation, capability and development, etc. Um, Is there any reason these couldn't go on Facebook to look at? No. Yeah, no, that's a good idea. I'll put on, on these days. That's a good thinking. I thought we'd spend a bit more time tonight on it, but with the delay in getting started, I've sort of accelerated this. Um, this was quite interesting. We've got contact details. Um, so, uh, we have Brett Carter from the Space Weather Research, Peter Arnold, I don't know who's spoken, uh, Jonathan Lynn. Um, so you might see some interesting names there, um, people I haven't met, some people I have met, so it was quite, quite good. Anyway, once again, I apologise for the dirty of that. Uh, yeah. After the event, I did want to be with the chairwoman of the review. Oh, yeah. I'm on the radio program this week. Oh, brilliant. Okay. That's great. So did you put my name up as the Australian Administrator for the Space Agency? That was my whole reason for going. Yeah. I've got a suit back in there. Um, so on Sunday, well, prior to this, we got invited, the association got invited to present to the Australian UN Youth um, Space Summit. Um, 
you guys never heard of before. But anyway, it's this non-profit group. They have chapters all around Australia. There's this UN Youth. It's the idea of is to, to motivate and encourage youth to get involved in politics and, and things like this. And what they've done, what they did, they decided to have a space summit uh, on, on Sunday. So um, they, they sent me an invitation to us. So I went along and did a quick overview of what we do as a group and kind of an uplifting sort of positive look at space activities in Australia and around the world, the technologies, new space, traditional government, etc., etc. And also got a message um, created and sent over from uh, Andrea Boyd. I don't know whether people know Andrea. Hi Australia, uh, welcome to the UN Youth Space Forum. Congratulations for being selected to participate in this and uh, we hope you have an excellent time. Uh, as you can see, space can lead to many awesome careers and there's a lot of different ways that you can get them. Welcome to the Geo Space Forum. Uh, it's great to hear that there are new, bright, uh, and young minds that are so involved in space and that want to work in medicine or law or engineering or math or so many things that can enable us to go and explore the moon, Mars, other planets, and do all these exciting things that basically only you guys can get help with. Too. So welcome, and I hope that you enjoy the forum. And from Australia, there's a lot of different ways you can get there, so do encourage you to uh, enjoy the time, chat to everybody, make good connections, and uh, look forward to hopefully seeing you as colleagues in the future. So it was all very last minute. I, we got invited in the middle of last week. The thing was on Sunday. I got Andy to do that on Friday night, so she was very kind to be able to do that. Um, but it was a great day. It was, uh, it was all day thing. We, I just uh, presented in the morning. So these were kind of year nine, uh, seven to nine uh, students, selected from all, kind of all around Victoria to go along the team. And they were great. They were really enthusiastic and very um, um, fired up. They broke off into separate sessions after I left, which I, I didn't stick around for, unfortunately. Apparently so, yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of a... No. So it was all organised by uh, universities for the student aged people. So uh, it was a really, as I say, I'd never heard it before, but I did a little bit of checking. It seemed to be legit. There was no, no money being exchanged or anything like that. So, okay, so moving forward, uh, I have a spend more time there. Um, as I mentioned last month, there's been a, an updated version of this Australian Facebook release. Um, and um, talk about history of Australia and space, etc. Kerry Doherty is uh, the author of that, and we'll actually have Kerry next month at our meeting in October. I think at this stage it'll be a remote login or a remote typing or something like that. Um, it'll be along with um, Richard Ponton, who's uh, got some work where he's got his time involved in the Australian space thing as well. So it should be a really good fun meeting next month. Those first astronaut moons on the right. Uh, that probably came from the first move. Yeah, yeah. um, over in South Australia, the uh, State Library of South Australia are running this uh, outback out of space, as we mentioned last month. That's on at the uh, State Library there. It's obviously in the lead up to the International Astronaut Day Congress as well, so it's going there. Well, if you know somebody over there, get them along and have a look at it. It's really good. Um, Sydney Space Festival is ongoing. I don't know whether you're involved with that thing. You probably run it. Um, so um, they've got a, quite a lot of stuff up happening up there. So if anyone's in Sydney or knows anyone that's up there that could be interested, get along. International Astronautical Congress. 
Um, anyone here going? Tim? Angus? Oh, you are. Fantastic. You're going? One day. Fantastic. Oh, good. Good. No one's missed out of the room? No. I can't get them So that should be quite good. Hopefully we'll maybe have some interesting uh, announcements and we'll hopefully get some reports at the table meeting from people that might have been there. Come on, I've got to think big. So this is coming up next weekend here in Melbourne. I think I gave you details last time, so we won't spend too much more time on that. Um, we're getting toward, toward the end of the year. So um, next, ma- next meeting will be 23rd of October, 17th of November. No day change for December. It won't be the fourth Monday of the month. It'll be the 18th of December, which will be the 3rd. And then it looks at this stage we'll be on the 22nd of January in 2018. So we're talking about 2018 already. Once again, memberships, you shall join. You shall be new. Um, teaser? Um, do you know what this is? I think yeah. it's, um, Aeros like 3D engine. Okay, so we're going to find a lot more about that in, after our break. Uh, later tonight. We have a couple of people in the room that are very responsible for it. So with that, uh, sorry for the late start, etc. With that, I'm going to now introduce uh, Tim Parsons as our feature speaker of the evening. Um, and I'll give you a bit of a... So Tim Parsons is a co-founder at XLab, Head of Strategic Partnerships at Fleet, Studio Tech Evangelist at iFlix, and co-founder and CEO of Delta V Space Hub, um, Australia's first space startup accelerator. Tim has a PhD in aerospace engineering from Imperial College London and over 25 years experience driving cutting edge digital innovation for Fortune 500 co- companies such as Audi, Amex, Apple Computer, Honda, Kodak, McDonald's, Sony, Toyota, Woolworths and over 100 other Australian regional and global clients. So, with that, I'm going to hand over to Tim. And now, do you need to plug your Mac in? No problem at all. Thank you very much for your video. Um, I'll just. It's been such a great. I'll just plug you in audio wise. Uh, air traffic controlling the ground, so yeah. Are you recording yourself, are you? I'm recording myself. It's for legal experiment. purposes. It's, okay. it's an experiment I'm running. Right, let me just plug you in. Two seconds. It's an experiment I'm running, so I don't know how it's going to go. but... All right. Uh, yeah, yeah. Pop it inside here. All right. Maybe audio on there. I don't. No. Simple. If you want a, um, I have a clicker. Oh, you've got it. Yeah. Fantastic. I'm all set. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you very much for having me tonight. Um, I'll try and live up to that very long and complex bio, but I'm also, um, I will call out that we do have two new space startups, if not three or maybe even four in the room in Angus, uh, from Aerospace Systems and also Graham and his colleague from Next Aero. Colleague's name is Dominic. Okay. And Graham and Dominic. Um, were uh, semi-finalists and now finalists in a competition that we're running at the IAC. So on the Wednesday afternoon, Delta V partnered up with Airbus, the French space agency, Kness, and the French embassy. And then afterwards, some other Australian organisations joined in, like Optus and the government of South Australia uh, and Austray, to run a new space and spatial innovation session and so we had 14 companies apply to be part of a pitch competition we're doing at that session and then we had three rounds of ultimately there will be three rounds of judging we've had two rounds of judging one of the judges is a spacex engineer we have uh, some french folks and then some australian folks and uh, just happy to say that uh, graham and his team from next Aero are, are, are one of the finalists so they're going to be pitching on wednesday and then just uh, 
uh, on Friday, Airbus announced that the prize that they're going to be pitching for is a return flight for two entrepreneurs to Toulouse to meet with them and meet with the new space community in France. So it's just calling that out. Uh, some very pragmatic uh, new space stuff happening. So I'm going to go through a uh, quite a technical presentation in a way. One of the things that we've tried to do over the last three years that we've been operating is to educate the ecosystem, educate decision makers, kind of move the idea of space from the gee whiz, but it only if we had if only we had billions and billions of dollars like NASA to the actually we could invent a next generation ecosystem here in Australia and leapfrog all of the other legacy aerospace sectors around the world. And Australia has a whole bunch of unique characteristics which I'm going to jump into. So roughly I'm going to go through some global space trends. I'm going to look at actually our, our situation um, it today and I'm also going to look at the startups that we have appearing on our radar. So Australia um, actually already comprises about 0.6% in terms of turnover of the global space industry. Um, so, and we spend about $3 billion a year on space, mostly exports. And also most of that money goes to what we're now calling old space. But in fact, the big global trend is miniaturization. The big global trend is the same digital culture that has brought us Instagram, that has brought us Google, that has brought us Apple and Facebook, that same digital culture has dived into space and said, you know what, why do we have to use space qualified products if some of the off the shelf products actually have similar performance characteristics? And so a few years ago, some people at NASA actually said, stop it, let's put a mobile phone in space because let's face it, a mobile phone has got exactly the same characteristics as a satellite has a CPU, has an antenna, has a battery system, it has GPS receiver inside it, it has a couple other extra things actually. It has a touch screen, nice stereo speakers, right? But it does have all the things that a satellite would need. So they flew an early Android model into space and it lasted 18 months in a low Earth orbit environment, reasonably tough uh, at radiation environment, and it lasted 18 months. And so they started to say, maybe some of the requirements we have for space missions have been overplayed. And so this entire revolution began where people started to make spacecraft literally with off-the-shelf consumer-grade parts. And they also leveraged the consumer electronics revolution. So a lot of very, very sophisticated electronics that previously you had to go to some specialist for became available from Samsung for a few bucks. And that essentially inspired a new generation of engineers to just buy stuff that was very cheap and actually, if it didn't last very long, that was okay because it wasn't about trying to create something that was going to last a long time. It was about how could they learn fast how to rethink a spacecraft. And so what we're seeing now is a, is a trend, just as PCs came along and initially were laughed at by the mainframes manufacturers, um, PCs revolutionized access to computing power. We're seeing these small satellites increasingly both individually and also as swarms and in mesh configurations are now really threatening and a really serious threat to the, if you like, monopoly of the big aerospace companies. Um, and they are literally a thousand times cheaper to build and a hundred times at least to fly. So um, we also have an interesting situation in the world right now where there's a lot, lot uh, that whole pressure to start to fly these cheap satellites, there's no dedicated launches. There is only launches required to fly very large, mostly government or big communications company style spacecraft. So there's suddenly a gap in the market opening up for people who want to fly mid-sats right down to nanosats. Um, there's also a demand in the world for more ground station capability, more things that are more tuned to smaller satellite missions, to more frequencies, to a proliferation of mission types. And so that's also starting to increase. And we're starting to also recognize that in a world where government budgets are being squeezed by an aging population, by the needs to educate new generations, by, you know, in some cases, the cost of education, defense, other things, the, the blank check that people in many ways got before 
that cost plus contract, that classic scenario that you might have had from the European Space Agency or NASA or your US Air Force, is going away. And so people are now looking for value. And so one of the impacts has been international collaboration, pooling resources. We saw that in the recent Cassini mission, even though it was a 20-year-old mission, that was a European Space Agency and NASA joint mission. And increasingly, we're also seeing massive social change. So there's a region that we now talk about, people like McKinsey and others talk about, called the ICASA region. India, China, Africa, South Asia. And this region is where most of the world's middle class are going to live. With, by 2030, our expectation is two-thirds of the world's middle class will be in this region, and they won't be Europeans, and they won't be in the Northern Hemisphere, not predominantly, um, with the exception of China. And and so this this profound change in population d demographics and of a group that will have a mobile phone, that will have the need to use data intelligently, to use applications and services intelligently, is, is actually forcing all of the governments right across these regions to invest heavily in next generation infrastructure, in digital systems for handling government services, because guess what, they can help you cut down on corruption, and a whole range of other social things that at scale can only really be delivered by digital systems. So these are some of the major trends in the world, and as we, as we see, this business model here is increasingly not sustainable, where we're spending hundreds of millions of dollars and you know, tens, if not you know, five plus years to build very large, quite fragile spacecraft, um, increasingly, this is going to become a smaller part of the industry, and the applications are going to be powered by things like this, but as I said, not one by one, usually in networks, usually in mesh scenarios. Um, so let's talk about Australia and space today. Now, you would know this, having been members of this organization. This is something that you probably thought about a lot, but it's worth stating it and having it on the tip of your tongue is Australia actually uses a lot of space services, as I mentioned before. We pretty much spend about $3 billion in a very fragmented way to import space services. Around 0.6 of the world's space industry turnover. Now, interestingly, Australia represents 1.6% of the world GDP. So in fact, we're underweight. This is all in the SIAA white paper. It's a very interesting point that was pulled out by that paper. That we're, in, in fact, we're underweight. And the reason we're underweight is because it's all export, pretty much. Most of the, the money that we spend on space is importing services. And so we think, if we're going to lift our participation in the global economy, the global space economy, to be on par with our proportion of GDP, then we should be able to build an industry here in Australia that would actually be much bigger than the wine industry, possibly even bigger than the wine industry and the fisheries combined. Uh, and that would be on parity with where we are as an advanced economy. Um, we also have a pretty unique set of responsibilities uh, in Australia's very small population, huge land area, um, and we keep losing airliners around the place. So we have um, also in a world of uh, lots of instability right now, uh, and lots of challenges with climate change, refugees, um, new political movements coming and going. We have a big responsibility uh, in Australia. Um, and we have uh, a lot of what we're describing as critical infrastructure that we rely on both for defence and for society. That is owned by other countries. That we have been effectively, in a very, very smart way, freeloading off for a long, long time. And one of the ways, for example, we freeload is that we are able to calibrate data in our southern hemisphere location for a lot of northern hemisphere com companies. So they give us a discount rate. And that's worked pretty well, and we've been pretty smart about that. Uh, but our view now is that actually space is becoming so critical that we can't afford to just phone it in. We need to have our own, uh, and we need to be operating our own, and we need to be exporting as well as importing. Um, industries are all moving towards data-driven flowing data models. The first industry that did this is actually the finance industry. And when algorithmic trading came along, the entire industry reorientated itself around flowing data. And we're seeing this now happening in agriculture. The agricultural industry is now getting its head around how it's going to look in a world of flowing data. 
the models that NAB, for example, uses to lend money are increasingly going to be based on proof that a farm is sustainable because they want to ensure that that asset has value in the future. And ideas like natural capital are reasons why KPMG is driving aggressively on, into IoT because they don't want to be sued in five years' time by a buyer of a farm where a farmer has been overusing pesticides or overusing um, uh, nitrate fertilizers or not drought proofing their property, right? So it's not about being a tree hugger, a lot of this environmental stuff. It's actually increasingly catching the attention of the financial industry, the insurance industry, and they want to know that there's future value to be had. Um, and in precision agriculture in particular, um, Australia is not a large producer of primary products when it compares itself to, say, Canada or the US. We're a deli. We produce a high quality green and clean product. And increasingly, we're going to need to be able to prove that using data, using technologies like blockchain, like smart contracts, to prove that this was made in Australia in a sustainable way. And space will be a big part in providing that proof. Um, and a whole lot of other industries. Um, the, the, the proof of this is that uh, there's a CRC that I'm also involved in that just successfully raised $250 million doubling down on this premise of agriculture and food moving to be to a digital foundation. And we're seeing the same thing in the energy industry. We're seeing the same thing in the transport sector. We're seeing the same thing in the medical sector, albeit slower. So what we also have in Australia is huge markets, as I mentioned before, the ICASA countries. Let's just take a quick snapshot of one of those regions, ASEAN. So one of the interesting things about ASEAN, one third of the population is less than 20 years old, and they have a quad-core Snapchat-driven Android phone that they got for about 25 bucks. And they actually have pretty good 4G and they have excellent Wi-Fi in these countries. And if you just take Indonesia, just here, that is a country that is about 20% bigger than the US in population. So these are markets where also Australia and Australian people are pretty welcomed. And a lot of the top people in the companies in these countries, as I've come to learn from doing business up in ASEAN over the last three years, were educated here. I met somebody in the Malaysian government who was a Collingwood supporter, right? And he studied at the University of Melbourne. So, and I've certainly met people in governments around the region and other organizations, big companies, who are like, you know, we meet Germans, we meet Americans, we meet Brits, we don't meet enough Australians, and quite, quite frankly, we'd rather hang out with you guys because you're cooler. I've literally had someone say to me that and then say, no, I'm serious. Um, I'm not just being nice. So, so we have this huge opportunity, and for future generations, we really need to engage. And guess what? They need space services. Uh, the Philippines has, I think, one or two or three Category 1 hurricanes go through every year. And after the first one's gone through, they still don't know how many schools and roads and bridges are left standing before the second one hits. And they have pretty smart people who we can collaborate with and help. And so we think Australian companies should be exporting. They should be getting involved in these huge, fast growing, fastest growing markets in the world and kind of maybe spending a little bit less time in the US and Europe uh, hanging out with uh, developed markets of, which are very slow growing and pretty red oceans really when it comes to the opportunity there. Um, so let's talk about some of these data stories. So this is a picture, some of you may have seen it, so apologies if it's old hat, but this is a picture where a machine has taken a photo of, in fact, hundreds of photos, I think. We've got a one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight by about so we've got about 160 photos there, um, of oil storage tanks, and it's orientated them all to around the same place. And you'll see that based on the shadow, you can kind of estimate whether the tank is full or empty. And this is the finance industry trying to predict the price of oil and gas futures. Right? And based on the intel they get from this kind of automated survey, they can decide what position to take, whether they're going to be a bull or a bear on the next 30 days of the market. Um, here's a really interesting story around change detection using a technology uh, that a Canadian company, MDA, developed, um, and it uses LiDAR. Uh, so what we're looking at here is a map from space, from space, of millimeter scale elevation change, right? So the red bits is where 
there's been a very, very, very millimetre scale shift in the elevation of the ground. So this is a, uh, this, this particular red area was detected by some ground surveyors first. They didn't have the satellite picture, they didn't have this picture. So they were running around in this big pit mine and they detected that there was a fault line there. Uh, and so they set up some instruments and laser beams and other things that try to measure the slippage of this particular piece of this giant open cut mine. But you can see from the space data that this area here was actually not detected by the guys on the ground. And this is what happened. And this was the area where they were, this, this area here is the area where they were training their uh, laser measurement equipment. And this area here is the one that broke down. Now, MDA managed to get this picture to these guys uh, early, and so they moved everything out. But the interesting thing was is that the satellite imagery predicted the slip. Um, unfortunately, Australian company and its subsidiary did not have access to this technology or weren't buying it. It's probably a better way to go. And so when they actually lost this uh, tailings dam in Brazil and lost half their market cap, right, three, four billion dollars. Um, that is an example of what you could have saved using data from space in a really intelligent way. So um, what we also have is we have something that is increasingly a factor, uh, and I think um, more and more people are plugging in to the fact that space is crack for geeks, right? Space is really great clickbait, the highest grossing movie in town uh, in, in the world was Avatar, um, which is a space opera. Um, the Right up there are the different Star Wars movies. So sci-fi and space stories are really, really high in the public interest, uh, and, and we are not leveraging that nearly as much as we could to create business models around it. Um, and then, of course, the next generation. Uh, so we have a big deficit in STEM. Apparently, if we were able to bring parity to the number of girls uh, who study science and technology in Europe uh, over the next 10 years, then there would not be a shortage of 120,000 positions, which there currently is in Europe, of scientists and engineers. Uh, all we need to do is, I don't even think we need to bring parity, I think we need to lift it by 10%. So we've got a lot of positions in our future which require both females and males to lean in harder on STEM and we need to inspire them and of course space does that. And we want to we want to kind of bring people home. We've got some amazing space engineers around the world um, and uh, they want to come home and they want an industry to come home to. Um, we talked a little bit about a few things you guys know about, something that we're involved in, the Square Kilometre Array of course, a big, big project in the astronomy community here. Uh, our astronomers are amazing and they build most of their own hardware. We're not really leveraging those folks enough. We did have a really successful mission uh, recently where three CubeSats were flown and two of them were managed to be rebooted and recovered after they had a battery uh, issue in, in storage. And so we had, uh, we had two out of three that Delta V is very proud to have been a, a party to that project. Uh, and those vehicles are now live and flying around the Earth, built by Australian students and Australian scientists. Um, and there is another spacecraft, which is a military project between Australia, Britain, and the US called Buccaneer. Uh, and that has also got an Australian GPS space uh, um, board inside it, uh, which is now the primary mission board, because the ones that the uh, European supply failed. So uh, I think it was a European supply. I should check that. And then recently, of course, as we were talking about the space agency discussion. So global trends, small satellite revolution, Australia is across it, huge demand for small satellite launch services, we definitely believe that is a possible future model. Demand for more ground stations, we're uniquely positioned here in Australia, unlike every other country in the world, we have every single GPS constellation, for example, all the six that are up there now or in, in, in being built all across Australia uh, at the same time. Um, international cooperation, uh, people certainly want to cooperate with us and want to do things with us and they, if, if, if we don't cooperate with them, they'll just come and hire our people. Um, and uh, we have lots of new business models okay, uh, that are appearing and are going to drive a huge amount of uh, economic activity in the future. 
So the new space opportunity. I should stop there very briefly. Any questions about any of that? Just Peter. I think, I think, I, I, you know, I think that there's a cultural element to our defense uh, establishment, certainly, where they, you know, we are a very unique country in that every major defense contractor has several offices in Australia. I can't think of many other countries in the world that have so much, for example, US and European defense presence. Uh, so we're pretty unique in that way. Certainly don't find them in New Zealand. Um, you don't find them in South Africa. So I think, uh, so I think there is an element where our defense role does sometimes cramp our style. But I also think that there's a new generation that seems to be coming through now and a, and a, a bigger impetus to create, um, new ways of doing things. And so we are starting to see the Air Force, Royal Australian Air Force, for example, experimenting with how to do RFPs, request for proposal in a different way using hackathon approach. Um, and we're starting to see people, uh, talk a lot more about space. Uh, as critical to Australia's defence, the latest defence white paper had about 25 times more mention of space than all the previous ones combined. I think it was 78 mentions of space in the current space white paper, and all the previous ones combined, there were about three. We counted. <laughs> we did it. We went, went and did it. Account. Um, so, so I think I think there's an element where we have had uh, a nervousness, and at the same time, we're sort of having a new generation of American and European people coming over here and saying, actually, we want to help local companies. Hence, Airbus supporting us in, in building local companies. And they're being smart in doing that because they realize if they help build a local industry, then there's a larger value chain to get engaged with. And so they're, they're being a bit more forward thinking in that way. Um, so certainly, I think it's become a lot more democratic. Um, but yeah, you know, it's a factor. We're a member of the ITAR agreement. And so, We've certainly had people, for example, from China who've come down to Australia wanting to invest in space companies. And it's really uncertain whether you can take their money and not start being followed around by men in black, you know. So, uh, and, and, uh, so that's something we'd love to clarify. But the IAC, uh, as I mentioned, the IAC in Adelaide, um, is going to be the largest conference of any kind that Adelaide's ever seen. Not just the largest space conference. So that's pretty impressive that there's this huge group of people that are coming down to Australia and discovering this place and hopefully falling in love with it while they're here. So, and we've all got a role to do in that investment. So, but talking about international cooperation, here are all the uh, countries that have got civilian space programs. And I kind of, <clears throat> I kind of put this up and then I sort of say, in Australia, we, yes, we're the last GDP, the last, um, uh, top economy, uh, to not have a space agency. Um, but you know, the last search engine was Google and they have last mover advantage and they're the biggest. So I think we have the opportunity to create a new type of space agency, a next generation space agency, space agency 2.0 is what I've been calling it and I did call it that in the round table. And that is one which engages, yes, in some amazing science missions and also has a, a, an avowed directive to build a domestic industry and to build a capability that's very cross-disciplinary. Um, certainly the private sector investment that's coming into space now, and that includes in Australia people like Blackbird, people like Grok Ventures, people like Green Collar, people like the CEO of Woolworths, that investment that's coming into new space right now is following that trend in the US. Um, and we're also seeing this interesting thing where you invest in a little space company and then they fly into space, and the moment that they get TRL 9, Tech Readiness Level 9, they'll get a big spike in their valuation. So there's also an investment thesis here, right, which makes sense to business people and, and passionate technologists, some of whom have lots of money, and we do have a few of those in Australia. Um, in Australia, we actually index pretty well. So we've got about 30 startups, um, not including the two guys in this room, because we did this count a few months ago. Um, we've raised now we've raised about 15 million bucks because since we did this slide, Gilmore's announced their close and also uh, another company called, I think it's Earth AI, closed the round as well with Blackbird. So we're, we're pushing way past that 10 million number now. Private money, 
no government money uh, except for maybe R&D tax grants for almost minimal uh, early stage funding from government. Um, we also had the first ISS payload from Australia, which was done by one of our startups, and we've launched three CubeSats, um, and there was a fourth, as I said, which was a military project that we were part of. Um, example companies, we've got two companies that are building constellations for IoT. They have different philosophies of how they're going about it, um, and I think both of them may ha they have unique advantages. Myriota, leveraging credible depths of antenna know-how in the Australian and South Australian scene in particular, developed and spun out to some extent by that military requirement. And Fleet, just a really strong moxie, uh, really identifying the problem with remote connectivity. Um, we also have uh, a credible launch company now in Australia. Um, Adam Gilmore is not uh, a classic engineer per se. He is a person that was in corporate finance and banking, but just couldn't get away from his core passion which was he wanted to be in, in aerospace and space in particular. So he's a very canny business person, and uh, he's also someone who's um, developed a great roadmap for developing his, his service, both from a business point of view and also a technology <coughs> point of view. 3D printing, hybrid rocket, um, and, and uh, lots of other technologies. And maybe there's a collaboration there. When you meet him, you can talk about that. Um, we've also got people like Saber Astronautics who've mashed up 3D game engines with machine learning to create systems to allow you to have one person managing fleets of spacecraft rather than massive teams of people required for one spacecraft. Um, and uh, this company in particular has been a foundation company for so many others. These guys did a lot of the analysis that ended up getting fleet <coughs> frequencies and they managed to do that in record time because they used a sort of next-gen approach. Um, and again, we've got other companies that are doing stuff in STEM. Uh, this one was the first one. They started in South Australia, the other two in New South Wales. Hopefully there'll be some others. And we have, again, a whole lot of other companies that are active, um, not including the ones in the room and not including another about 10 that we've discovered in the last three months. Um, so, question... Could we grow a massive domestic industry capability here in Australia? Um, and if we looked at the trajectory that the US has been on, the answer mathematically seems to be yes. So we're going to study that a little bit. Um, there's certainly a massive trend, as we talked about a little bit, about digital. Um, here's a really great, I don't know how many of you have seen these slides before, but here's a great picture. This is the convocation of Pope Benedict the 16th in 2005, and here's the same event in 2013. That is what happens to society in that time. And that's four years ago, right? Um, and this is not just about Italians. And so this, this middle class change that I talked about before, current middle class, look at the numbers in the Northern Hemisphere in particular. They don't, those don't change very much. But if you look at the numbers in the Southern Hemisphere and MENA and ASEAN, they change a lot. And this is our, these are our people. You know, these are people who are using services and in fact need to use, uh, want a lifestyle that's like ours, but we need that lifestyle to be more efficient, more sustainable. It can't be as wasteful as ours is right now. They need to use less plastics. They need to use less of an impact on the environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The only way we think we're going to pull that off is with data. Um, we've also got a pretty good uh, compound interest growth rate for the space agency. It's uh, pretty good, 14, 15%. We went and dug into the numbers and found that it's better than real estate. Um, and so that we're on track to hit a roughly a trillion dollar industry. There's a, some debate whether it's 750 or a trillion. They're big, thumping numbers. And we also believe that the mix is going to change quite dramatically and that the a large fraction of it's going to be new commercial activity. The UK industry set themselves a target. They said, well, UK is 10% of the global GDP right now. I think they've fallen a bit, but back then when they set the target, they had a big GDP proportion. So they set themselves a, t a goal to have a 10% share of that industry, and that worked out to about something like 70 billion pounds, I think, when you rounded it out from US dollars to pounds. Um, uh, so again, uh, the other thing that also is happening is, is that a value chain is shaking out. So previously the value chain was sell this to NASA. 
or sell it to a scientist. And the value chain increasingly is starting to look like this, where you have infrastructure in orbit delivering value to application providers who are solving problems, <coughs> and those problems are massive scale on the Earth. And business 101 is, is that for an investor, uh, if, for, if, for, for cash flow, the value actually increases as you get closer to the customer. So we're already seeing that a lot of government services that are being provided for free right now are actually going to move to a commercial model or move to different funding models. So things like weather, a lot of the big weather spacecraft, for example, around the world are at end of life and they have not been funded. Uh, uh, the US Navy, for example, has, has had its own weather constellation for a long time. It has not had funding for the new one. So they are looking to commercial operators to provide them with the kind of prediction that they need to safely deploy their vehicles. And that's increasingly a factor. So we're, we're seeing that there's an opportunity for all levels of this value chain to access new commercial funds. And also we're seeing these, we talked about these use cases before. Um, so what would a global, what would a $40 billion industry look like? So if we actually pushed ourselves to 4% of global turnover, which would be a super aggressive BHAG, um, but if we were just 4% of global space turnover, we would have a $40 billion industry by 2030, which would employ thousands and thousands of people. Um, we certainly, if we can just move ourselves by 2020 to more than 1% of global turnover, a little bit less of a BHAG, if we can just move ourselves to there, how big an industry could we create in Australia? How much impact could we have and how integrated into the world space economy might we become and actually we're pretty aggressive about that and we think somewhere between these numbers is where we're going to land probably right um, we'll fix that up later but anyway the 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 yeah i think you're right i think i've spotted a, a I, I had a typo in here but somewhere between i mean if we had a 10 billion dollar industry um uh that would be bigger than the wine industry in australia which employs thousands of people. And all of you guys would have a job in the space industry because we would need your knowledge, we would need your leadership, we would need your uh, help to also communicate those industries, right? Because you look at the wine industry, there's thousands of people who are not actually on the vineyard. They're just there marketing, collaborating, making labels, making wine, handing the transport, doing all those other elements. Um, so uh, if business models stay the same, so why, why existing companies should support this? So if business models stay the same, there's no, no loss. So they can bet on business models staying the same. Good luck with that. If value chains are going to be massively disrupted, then the cost is going to be huge, huge. For them. Um, so we think what they should do is make some bets in new space and start to get involved in the new space world and start to lift up some of these entrepreneurial teams and try to change and learn from them. Uh, you have a young engineer and let's say he or she has a choice do I go and work with Boeing, which is my where my heart leads me, or do I go and work with Google? Well, what if they go and work with Boeing and they discover an organization that's rusted on, right? That's kind of male, pale, and stale, you know? Like, and what if they go to Google and they discover an organization that's actually highly technically agile, that is looking to do things in the space industry, that is looking to use data in new ways? Where are they going to go with their career? And that is the problem that big aerospace has right now. So. Those guys have a cultural time bomb that's ticking, uh, which is retention of the highest talented people. So new space is actually a critical cultural mo movement, so this is my argument. They should just make some bets. And, and happily, I think, since what we did this slide, a lot of the big companies have actually contacted myself and my co-author of this and said, we believe you and we're going to use this slide <laughs> to help create change in our own organization. Um, this is the session that's on Wednesday. These are the sponsors that we managed to get together. Um, I will call out that the French believed in us early on 
and Airbus, Kness and the French Embassy leaned in hard when we started talking about doing something with new space in the IAC and they managed to use their elbows to create a space for us at the IAC. So, uh, and then some other companies also, and the South Australian government and Optus and Austrade followed their lead. Um, and so we're hoping that we can create a bit of a discussion and, and in showcasing teams like yours, Graham, and also having you along, um, Angus, and making sure that you're there, um, that we can start that conversation about the amazing talent we have in this country. Um, where should we be placing our bets? Okay, let's, let's, you've all been through that round table, or many of you have been through the round table. We think that we have incredible competitive advantages in these areas. This is probably the last couple of slides if you're, if you're about to drop off. Um, cause I'm boring you, I'm sure. But, uh, we have incredible competitive uh, advantages in spatial data and decision services. And in particular in Melbourne, we have had an amazing talent base here. Um, we also have incredible ground and space operations. We are part of the Deep Space Network. We have loads of engineers who are involved with Square Kilometre Array and, and, and other projects. Um, we do have a number of our universities and research organisations in these other areas are just world class, uh, despite very low funding for some of them. Um, and I haven't mentioned things that are starting to get on our radar, like quantum computing, which... Uh, appears to be increasingly seen as a new form of um, communication. The entanglement of two particles allowing us to do extremely high bandwidths, ignore the ba barrier of speed of light, don't even need line of sight, that's all coming. Right? That's all, that stuff's all coming, it seems, and, I, and, and that we're starting to have a few people ask questions about um, non-line of sight comms just using quantum entanglements and, cu and qubits for cracking encryption. Higher risk things, um, orbital launch facility, manned space, hypersonics, large satellites, a traditional space program. But you know, there are ways to break these down into more minimum viable products or certainly proof of concepts. And so, for example, Gilmore, he has built out, Adam Gilmore and his team, they have built an incremental roadmap that they're going to start with suborbital and then they're going to successively grow their vehicle size and learn as they go. And so they created a good test and learn roadmap for themselves to take on orbital launch. And then we have a couple of companies that are trying to set up facilities here because they think Australia is actually a damn good place to launch spacecraft from. Um, it might interest you to know we did a little study and we discovered that Woomera is right smack in the middle of the range of latitudes of all the big space launch facilities. There's a bit of a furphy that's been going around for 20 years. Ah, oh, Woomera, it's not on the equator, so it doesn't compete. Well, guess what? The Russian launch facilities, Vandenberg, all those are way further north than Woomera is south. And Tanegashima, which is Japan's main launch facility, is about bang on north compared to Woomera south. Yeah, that's well, they, they do manned space as well to the ISS. So in fact, the vehicle performance now is so high that the delta V difference <laughs> is not as big as it used to be. Proton rocket, exactly. It launches from like 80 degrees. It's incredible, right? But, and it's doing a, it's doing an ISS orbit match. So, so it's a bit of a, so, so actually, we've also got people looking at facilities in the Northern Territory. There's a lot of oil and gas infrastructure up there. So people are thinking about launching, uh, to the east of Darwin. Uh, Equatorial Launch Services is the company looking at that. And there's another business, Australian Launch Services, that is looking at the Queensland coast again and seeing that there are certain areas where the air traffic is pretty low. So, well, no, who knows, right? Uh, anyway. We think that there's an opportunity to, you, that the government doesn't have to spend billions of dollars, actually. The government can be a seed investor here, and the government can use its, the federal government and the state governments, but in particular the federal government because of its sovereign powers, can sign international agreements, can join international missions, and by doing so give Australian businesses and teams the chance to pitch for components of those missions. And that is exactly the business case that the Brits adopted when they were considering whether they were going to spend money on the European Space Mars mission or the European Space uh, um, mission to upgrade the ISS facility. The reason the Brits decided to spend the extra money was because they realised that it would be returned in more opportunities for British companies to pitch. And lo and behold, who is building the Mars descent stage for the European Mars mission by a British company. They won the pitch. So it worked. 
So we, we're sort of seeing that that idea is, is core. Is let's leverage our $3 billion spend that we're currently exporting. Let's defragment our industry and our institutions. And let's have an explicit, deliberate program to build a domestic space economy and anchor it in new space, the next generation, and leverage your wisdom and, and your connections. That's my presentation tonight. I hope it was okay. <laughs> How did I do? Was that all right? No, it's not. Um, ah, I'm sorry. Was, this guy? It was, it was a bit business school, I know. Yeah. It was great. Um, and there was an error. And then you're the first audience to pick me up on that one. I should fix that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. We'll open the floor up to uh, some questions. I've got a question for you. How I'll do my best. How critical do you think having our own domestic launch capability is to the success of, of an Australian space industry? Um, I think... I used to think that it wasn't that critical. I used to think that launch was at the bottom of the value chain and that Australia would be better off addressing its strengths to the top of the value chain. Um, but it turns out that it seems that launch is one of those foundation pieces of infrastructure that doesn't just provide a way to get to orbit. It also provides a huge impetus. And if we can build a domestic launch capability that is profitable by addressing where the demand is globally, I think we'll regain a lot of confidence. And I also think that if we can take our young people and our young engineers and even our investors and our government people to those launches, and if they're in Australia, then there's a very strong media moment there, which is worth a lot. So I've kind of come around to the view that if we can make it something that's um, uh, manages to stand on its own feet commercially, and then also manages to inspire the rest of us, then let's do it. And, you know, if the Kiwis can do it, why can't we? <laughs> Hi. G'day, Tim. My name's Len. Is Hello, this working? Len. Yeah, um, that's a fantastic presentation. The pitch is really good. What you're actually pitching is a major paradigm shift to the way space is done. And as you know, paradigm shifts are difficult to achieve. Now, in Canberra, the currency is electoral. It's votes. So what's the real politic here? What do you see are the hurdles and obstacles you need to overcome now in 2017 in Canberra? What do you need to do to sell this? The, the currency that a politician has is definitely press releases. So the business driver of a politician is how can I get more press releases? The currency both on, the, on both sides of government is also how do we transform the Australian innovation system? because we spend about $15 billion a year on research through our universities, our RDCs, Research and Development Corporations, and also CSIRO. And we're not getting a good return for that money. In other words, we're, we suck at commercialization. Right? We, we, we're sort of falling down there. And so I think the currency here is by increasing the efficiency with which we commercialize that research, by leveraging the money we're already spending and double spending in the case of lots of space data. We're buying, you know, Geosciences Australia is buying this bit, CSIRO is buying that bit, these universities over here, they're buying bits and pieces. We're, you know, we're doubling up uh, our spend. If we can just leverage that money, actually we'll create new jobs and new industries and spend less government money. So I think that's the pitch. The challenge is, is that in the next budget cycle, we still need to get some seed funding. And the fear is, is that seed funding will create another public institution that just sucks on the public teat and doesn't deliver you know, a return. So I was tackled on this on Sky News by one of the uh, panelists who was, um, who was playing a role, who's playing a role of being the you know, complete naked capitalist um, free marketeer. And he was playing a role. Um, which you do have to do on TV because it is theatre. And, and his view is, well, I don't think any government money should go to it. And in the format, I didn't really have a chance to rebut, but my argument to him was, if you spend this money, this seed capital from federal government, and you spend it wisely, you'll end up spending less public money, I believe. 
Um, and, and that is what I want people to sort of engage with. Well, how will that work? I want people to ask that question. I want people to have that powerful question in their minds and, and then the politicians will get the response. So, um, on the issue, yeah. sorry, Angelo, can you say Hi, Angelo. I'm in stream, Thank you. Uh, we're all emo emotionally caught up in the Australian uh, space agency. Yeah. Yep. But you made a really good point there about the likelihood that it just becomes another, you know, another mouthful. Correct. Uh, is there not some other structure, uh, an association of entrepreneurs like yourself, that can actually be money where it's needed as opposed to having government control in this? Because I wouldn't trust the government as far as I can go. I, look, I, I have to say that there's a lot to be said for your argument. And again, for the last couple of years, people who know me um, know that I was actually a little bit skeptical about the, the, the space agency myself. For me, I was scared that we were essentially going to the government as we've been doing for the last 20 odd years and saying, give me money so I can buy some toys, right? But at the same time, I also learned that from a branding point of view, space agency works really well. I want to call the people in Australia who know how to help me land my spacecraft in Woomera. No one's answering that phone call from the Japanese space agency right now. They're approaching random Australians in international space conferences and saying, do you have that number? Because <laughs> we've got a second space probe, a second Hayabusa space probe, and we want to land that mother in the Australian outback and we don't know who to call, right? So, so there's a there's a very powerful cut through in saying Australian Space Agency as a coordinator, and also it turns out that because of international agreements, um, as a sovereign country, our ability to underwrite missions from an insurance point of view to guarantee that if there's an accident, Australia will contribute to any cleanup or any compensation is often the price of entry to the party. So I sort of put aside my own reservations about the structure of the thing and I said, let's call it Australian Space Agency because everyone will have a sense that that is who you call. <coughs> but then let me try and advocate for Space Agency 2.0. And then I realized, and, and I met quite a few po people who work in places like NASA and places like European Space Agency, those organizations are trying to reinvent themselves to become more entrepreneurial. They're reaching out to the new space community. They're asking for co-funding opportunities. They're trying to rethink how their models are operating because they know they're in a dwindling fiscal situation as far as the public purse, right? And, and so um, for, as a proportion of public expenditure, certainly NASA's budget has shrunk as a proportion. It's still a lot of money. But as a proportion, so, so increasingly they look back at their core why. Why does NASA exist? To discover life in the universe and also help human beings place themselves in the cosmos. That's a big why that they have. Do they need to spend hundreds of billions of dollars to do that? Maybe they don't. Maybe they just need to coordinate. Maybe they just need to co-fund. Maybe they just need to collaborate better. And so I'm arguing that in Australia, why don't we just jump to that model right off the bat? We use Canberra, we use the states, and we actually be a little bit less competitive, another C word, and work out how to collaborate better, how to have a less fragmented ecosystem. And then folks like Graham here or like Angus, suddenly they can unlock all of the expensive infrastructure that you guys have paid for, right? We have incredible infrastructure in the Defense Department. We have incredible infrastructure in CSIRO, in our universities. And the utilization rate's probably less than 1%. Probably way less than 1%. Why does somebody like Graham have to go through huge hurdles to get access to that? Right? And when you look at it that way, you suddenly go, wow, what's all this red tape we're putting in front of the next generation? Australian entrepreneurs who are going to create something amazing and yet we're tying them up and we're treating them as if they're cowboys and we're saying no, 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 it's only if you turn up with a big international space logo or a military 
you know, US Air Force that will pay attention to you. That's kind of the received experience of a lot of entrepreneurs. So does that help answer your question? Sorry, long answer. Yeah. But the team working on the paper at the Melbourne thing talked about democratization of space and it is on the radar. It's on the radar. It's on the radar. They're yeah. hearing it. There's another really powerful concept, sorry, real quick, which is called social license to operate. And space won't have that social license to operate unless we democratize all the stories that we're so passionate about and we love, right? And, uh, and so I think that's gonna, that's gonna broaden the remit, not just engineers and tech, but also art, philosophy. What's it like to live on Mars? There's a moment that we're hoping happens in our lifetime when the moon and Mars get their own IP address ranges. Right? That's going to happen. And com companies like Fleet have put it out there that their next, after they've cracked the Earth, they want to do the same thing on the Moon and on Mars. And that's a real business model. Sorry, your question was there. So Melbourne University is currently building a CubeSat. You're probably aware of it. They've got a budget of $200,000. It's going towards it. $70,000 is going towards the fabrication of the spacecraft, the launch cost, uh, and all the engineering that goes behind that, the instrumentation, etc. A hundred and thirty thousand of the two hundred thousand dollars is going to legal fees, of which half is going directly to the government. I believe it's the Australian Space Office for the licensing, etc. So even though the satellite's going to be launched offshore, it has to be licensed out of Australia. But isn't this an example of the red tape, the problems where two thirds of the budget are actually going in administrative and legal fees, and a third of the budget is actually going to the science and the engineering behind it? So. Um I would ask, have they been badly advised because the other companies and teams, university teams and private companies that have gotten an overseas launch certificate in Australia have gone for the ministerial waiver route. And in fact, universities have a particular ability to get the minister's attention and get that waiver. So certainly the Space Coordination Office uh, they don't have their, their fees are not that significant. They're significant, but they're not that significant. And the maximum probable loss calculation is complex, but it's not ridiculously complex. So I would imagine that it, it would be worth their while checking in with uh, the folks who have done this previously, like the Australian Centre for Space Engineering Research or ANU or University of South Australia, how they cut through and got that ministerial waiver, or even Cube Rider, who's done it now a couple of times. So, And I think the um, part of the space activities review process is to look at, well, what's a good regime right, for Australia? The current regime that's still been in operation for the last 15 years was designed for big corporations who might be launching from Australia and it didn't take into account the CubeSat revolution. Um, I certainly believe that legal fees, as in lawyers charging them money, well, pick a lawyer who's going to pro bono that for you, and there are some around. You know, People like Freehills, for example, love this area, and they would not want to see a team like University of Melbourne um, ha spending all that money on legal fees. So definitely let's collaborate. And if, if you need email addresses or phone numbers of people to co contact, and how did you do it, and how did you get around this, um, uh, certainly there are people in, uh, in Sydney and in, in, uh, in Adelaide who've, who've cracked it previously um, and in Canberra. And so let's, let's save that $130,000 and get them to spend it on something. I think it's already spent. Oh, well. Get them a refund. <laughs> Maybe they spend that money on advisors. You advise them to pay them that money so they wouldn't have to pay legal fees. <laughs> <laughs> We're very good at that in Australia, aren't we? Yeah. <laughs> okay, well... Um, Thank you very much, Tim, for coming down. Tim came down from Sydney for this, and uh, we really do appreciate you coming along tonight. Unfortunately, the attendees are a little bit, little bit uh, down on a normal monthly thing. I think it was a change of schedule, but we really appreciate it. It's going out live on the internet and be a vidcast as well. Fantastic. And uh, a little traditional gift to you. This is um, a, a pin from the association. We give thank you, you very much. Speakers. It's beautiful. And... Um, we really thank you once again for coming down. Thank you. I'll wear it with pride. Thank you. Thank you very much. Peter. Thank, you. thank you, everybody. So we're going to take a little break now, just about 10 or 15 minutes, and we'll get set up for our next... Uh, I think the barbecue. Anyway, um, take, a, take a break. Have a chat with someone you haven't met before. 
going to get a drink, do whatever, and we'll convene back here at at five to ten, five to nine. Right? And in between time, please pounce on Tim and ask any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, so Tim said to shoot off, he put the rest of his life to this, so he's got stuff to finish him off. So, uh, welcome back. Uh, we now have a presentation from uh, Graham Bell, who's at Next Era, and Dominic, his colleague, is here as well. Um, Project X, a report on Monash University, Amarillo, Amarillo, 3D printing aerospike engine, which uh, hit the media just the other day, and we jumped on Graham as soon as we saw it, because we were very excited. Thanks very much. Uh, is this too loud? No, but we're doing it. Okay, it's just the yeah, here. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Graham Bell. Uh, you might have seen this project, as uh, as we said in the in the news. Um, yeah, Michael called me and said, "Well, I'd love to give a presentation on it just before we're going to the IAC uh, next week to basically present what we've done and the collaboration that sort of thing." And I said, "Yeah, sure. Sounds like a great opportunity." Um, what we have done, basically, since January, um, we had this collaborative project to, to build basically a 3D printed, additively manufactured uh, rocket engine. Um, the project started, yeah, in January, and it was initially, you know, a very secret project between uh, us and our primary partner, Amero, um, and they, they do the additive manufacturing, and, and for a secret project, you need a code name, our code name is Project X. That kind of stuck, and so now it's Project X, so that, yeah, that's okay, so. I'm from Next Aero, that's the group that we've created uh, to essentially represent you know, the students, the PhD students uh, in this. So myself, uh, Joel, Dominic Tan, which is it, just over there, uh, Nicholas Nathan Smith, Thomas Nust, and uh, Marcus Wong, a part of the design group. In terms of Amero, uh, we have Martin Jerg, um, you might remember we gave a presentation a couple of years ago um, on an RMIT rocket. Um, he now works for works in conjunction at part-time at an era doing some pretty cool 3D printing stuff, so that's sort of where the project comes from. Uh, our project partners were Woodside Future Lab and Monash University, uh, who provided some funding for the project. So, how did it start? What is the genesis? Um, basically, Amero Additive Manufacturing, a couple of years ago, you might have seen, they did a 3D printed uh, jet engine. Um, it was in the news, it was really exciting. Um, I guess, you know, the project goals for the jet engine was uh, not necessarily making something that can run and something that can actually be tested, but more so, what are the individual you know complexities in right, starting to make these three D printed components? How do we <coughs> make the turbine casing or the exhaust or or, or you know the shrouds that sort of stuff? They all have particular uh, complexities that you know additive manufacturing engineers are trying to overcome. So that was you know the landmark project there, the the you know, three D printed gen engine. Since then, Martin's work, the the guy from from Avera, has been with uh, rocket engines now. These rocket engines are basically, again, technology demonstrators. What they're looking at is basically, you can see, maybe in the wall here, this really complex lattice structure. So with a 3D printing process, you basically get all the complex complexity in your design uh, essentially for free. That just, that just comes with the nature of the project. Um, what they've been looking at is more on how do we design this lattice structure for fatigue, or for heat transfer, or you know, complicated processes like that. It's, it's more looking at how do we actually make these things rather than getting these things running. Just so happened that you know they've been 2015 the jet engine now 2017 with all these rocket engines sort of came to me and they said Martin said uh, what would it take to actually get one of these rocket engines that we've been printing can we make a public demonstrator can we make something that's you know really visual for the public uh, to actually see and what would it take to actually get that running and I said wow that's that sounds like a really big project uh, doesn't sound easy at all but you know what I, I don't know let's let's find out so. Basically, I was super intrigued and I, I went with Marty to Amero and we basically had a meeting and they said, we want to make a rocket engine. I said, okay. And they said, okay, it's got to have three things. Number one, it's got to be novel. It's got to utilize this additive manufacturing or 3D printing capability that is looking at all the, you know, the complex internal structure. Number two, we want it done relatively quick. We want it done from Paris Air Show. <coughs> At the time from January, that was in around four months. And number three, we want it relatively cheap. The phrasing they used, of course, was we're exploring avenues of funding, and I think everyone here can read, read between the lines, or you know what that means, it needs to be cheap. You know, as a traditional engineer, my kind of warning bells sort of went off. Uh, this is the engineering triangle, you can either have fast, cheap, or good, you can pick two, you can't have three. I'm thinking, you know, fast and good, 
uh, it's going to be in this this, uh, this corner. But you know, I, I, I sort of sort of let it go. You sort of see, see, see where it can go. So, who am I, and what business do I have in making rocket engines? I am a PhD student at the Laboratory for Turbulence Research in Aerospace and Combustion. Uh, what we work on there is supersonic jet noise. So, basically, why are aircraft, why are rockets, why is any kind of jet coming out the back of some sort of craft, why is it noisy? It turns out that a, any sort of really fast moving fluid, the interaction with the, the sort of shear and the, the quiescent fluid around it is really, really good at making noise. They're just efficient generators. We look at supersonic jet noise in all kinds of ways. We look at single jets, twin jets, pinion jets, like a rocket motor on the, on the ground, that sort of stuff. Uh, we have you know, specializations in fluid mechanics and heat transfer. You know, we teach these classes every day, and these are the exact topics you need to design rocket motors. For us, supersonic nozzle design, that is whether it's a, you know, a fighter jet, whether it's you know, a nozzle for just generating uh, supersonic flow, whether it's a rocket motor, they're all the same. These are the things we use every day. So I went back to my lab and I found the PhD students and I said to them, do you want to make a 3D printed rocket motor? And within about three seconds I had the uh, uh, rocket design dream team uh, signed up. So that worked really well. Okay, so 3D printing, additive manufacturing. I'll just explain it because when I started I, I had no idea. Can I just get everyone to raise your hand? I'm going to take a quick, I just want to take a quick survey of uh, what everyone knows. So everyone raise your hand, we'll use a process of uh, elimination to, to work on what we know. All right. Keep your hand up if you knew uh, 3D printing was a thing. Great, everyone knew. Okay, number two. Keep your hand up if you knew 3D printing could be done in metals. Okay, number three. Keep your hand up if you can name a metal 3D printing technique. <laughs> Almost all of you. Ah, oh, there's two. Great, excellent. Well, you did more than I started. Okay, 3D printing is a thing, okay? Uh, we do it with polymers, that's probably what you see most of the time with this sort of 3D printing technique. It's called, this sort of style is called fused deposition modelling. It's basically the hot glue gun approach of 3D printing. Uh, we're extremely very fine filament of plastic, uh, basically just layering it up. We want to work with uh, engineering, we need metals, we need the strength, we need the weight, we need the heat transfer, that sort of thing. Uh, on the metal side, we have a few techniques. Selective laser melting is probably by far the most common, and it's the, it's the technique that Amero specialises in. What happens in 3D metal printing? We lay out, we have a, a hopper that basically drops a very, very fine layer of metallic powder. That comes across and drops a layer about 40 micron thick. From that, a laser from the top then melts in a pattern, and that joins, that fuses that metal layer to itself, and about three layers below. We keep repeating that process up and up and up and up, and by many thousands of layers, we can actually make a, a, a part from that. So yeah, Amero is specializing in selective laser melting, or SLM. Okay. The next thing about uh, 3D printing is the build size. So if we have, you know, just imagine an A4 page, you've got some margin area in which you can print. You can't print right to the edges of the page, you can only print you know, so far in. 3D printing, same, same deal. You can only go to so far in the machine, you can't go all the way to the edges. Uh, you, so you have this idea called build volume. You can make anything you want as long as it fits inside that, inside that volume. Our job was essentially to get a rocket and put it inside a box, and that was that. That's basically the, the challenge that was put to us. You know, like we had this size, uh, we had to basically get a nozzle, fit that nozzle, the whole geometry inside. Now, whether you do that in one part or you know multiple parts, if you do multiple parts, it means you need to be able to actually you know a high temperature rocket, you need to be able to seal those parts together. You know, we can't use O rings, we can't use sealants, that sort of stuff. With combustion gases, they're so hot they'll just simply melt those things. So if you can print it all in one go. That is in a one-piece construction, we already have. In our case, the geometry size is about 250 by 250 by 300 millimeters. It's a sort of box like that big. So, we knew the box size. We went away and we said, okay, what is the most powerful rocket engine we can put in this box? So we did the initial size. Now, I don't know if anyone's used this uh, design, but it came from basically the Rocket Lab, 1960s. Uh, essentially what it is, is it's liquid fuel design for kind of hobbyists. It's all this kind of like levers and strings kind of thing. It's really cool like, to control the valves. But anyway, they have a design uh, methodology. They basically start with the simplest combustion chamber for a rocket engine you can have. So you spray gases in the back here, they burn, they go through this throat geometry, uh, and then you basically expand over the back. And it works, works you through the, uh, the steps in, in order to actually solving the rocket. Now, it's, it's pretty simple. It can be done in an Excel spreadsheet. And when we did that to find out how powerful we could make this rocket engine, we came up with something that was about this powerful. So it wasn't going to be enough. Now the problem is, is of course the length of the nozzle. It needs to be really long. Like you need to have, you know, a, a certain height, and it's just not going to fit in our box. Okay, so we went away and basically said, 
is this the only design you can have for open hospital? Now, aerospace engineers will instantly tell you, no, it's not. To the general public, it might not be so obvious. Uh, if we take the traditional rocket nozzle design, and we look at it over here, now if we cut it at the throat, and we take these two sections here where we're expanding the gas out the other side, and we instead flip them inside out, shrink them down, and push them back inside the engine, look like this, you get something called an aerospike nozzle. This is literally what happens. That's, that, that's the process. That's an aerospike nozzle. Now, number one, clearly it's going to be much shorter, so it's you know, pretty advantageous. This is you know, some of the reason why you can see the engine over here. That's the actual one fired. Uh, why it looks the way it does. And number two, uh, it has this really special property with a plume. A plume here, the, the exhaust that comes out is actually invariant to the altitude. That means uh, it produces slightly more efficient than a traditional rocket engine by about, say, 5 to 10%. So it's not much, but you know, it's a little bit there. An aerospike nozzle on, this, uh, on its own, though, doesn't come for free. Uh, we have to think of ways of how we're actually going to support the spike. That spike is also going to be in combustion gases, so you know, it's going to go hot, it needs to be cooled. So on the one hand, we have this engine that is smaller in size, higher in efficiency, and potentially has this idea of a thrust vector. So that basically means that we can pump in more fuel on this side and actually get the gases to be more powerful on this side. Actually, you can tilt the engine just from the, the front, from the power on one side versus the other alone. And that means basically you can bolt the engine straight to the, to the chassis of the rocket. It means you can just make you know, some weight savings, but you know, it's smaller in size, higher efficiency, but some weight savings. It's, you know, it's a little bit of a benefit here. On the downside, unfortunately, very difficult to make, very difficult to cool. Um, obviously, we need to be able to support the spike. Obviously, we need to be able to cool it. We have all this really complex internal geometry. Um, how do we actually solve that? Well, with a 3D printer, those problems potentially go away. We can actually print all this cooling stuff in it. We can, don't have to worry about how someone's actually going to make it. We don't have to worry about saws or drills or lathes or any other kind of machine. We can just print out a sign in one go. So, we thought this was a good idea. We took it to America. And we have a look at what they're doing. They're making conventional Dillaval, that is a traditional rocket engine uh, shape there, and those, those things. They're working with this really complex internal structure, and we said, well, maybe we can use this on the aerospike. So we pitched it to them and said, how about an aerospike? They said, I don't know what you're talking about. But we said, okay. So we came back about a week later, and we showed them this orb-looking egg thing. And that was, this is literally the, the images that we showed them, you know, one week later. This is, this is what they saw. We said it's going to make about 300 kilograms of thrust. It's going to fit, this is the green box here. It's going to be slightly smaller, and it's going to have these multiple combustion chambers. The multiple combustion chambers basically come from these fins you might be able to see here. The fins were basically going to hold this structure, basically to stop the spike rattling uh, around the middle thing, and that will basically divide the combustion chambers. With the multiple combustion chambers, potentially you can do that thrust vectoring thing. They were very intrigued. So, you know, we kind of went forward. We said, hold on, we don't only need a, uh, we don't only need a, um, you know, an engine, you also need, you know, all the supporting gear that goes along with it. We need some sort of test stand, test stand on wheels, that's a trailer. Uh, we need, you know, we need to be able to fuel the thing, we need to be able to cool the thing, we need all this infrastructure, the systems that go with it. So, we had a timeline to complete in four months, we suggested a trailer, we said it was going to kind of look like something like this, maybe. Um, uh, you know, there are, I've worked on liquid fuel rockets before. Um, I know how difficult cryogenic fuels are to handle, to use, to license, all that sort of stuff. We only had four months, I basically, basically just sort of agreed from the um, concept stage, we're going to go with this gas propellant system. Now, uh, the gas propellant system basically, it's going to produce the same <coughs> physics in the engine, the, the profiles, the design is exactly the same, but now the problems with handling the cryogenic liquids, with getting them, with uh, doing all this sort of complex stuff, with the refrigerated liquids goes away. Finally, we said we just need some print time on this, on this engine, and of course, a couple of dollars, uh, and we can make it work. And they said, okay, come back to us with the design. So this, was the, this is the concept design. We're now up to uh, preliminary design by this point. We basically went away and we said, okay, now we've actually got to make this thing. We've got to start thinking about all these things that go into you know, making an actual rocket engine work. We've got to think about how we're going to measure the, you know, measure the performance of it, how we're going to cool the thing, how we're going to design the test stand, how we're going to design uh, the actual engine itself. Uh, and, and control the thing. Um, so basically, we took each one of the members, signed a face to a name, and we, we thought, we said, okay, we're in there four months, we've done lots of group projects before, we know that you know, they become very complicated very quickly, especially with so many independent systems. Designing, you know, five or eight individual spreadsheets to tie all these things together clearly doesn't work. So what we did was we came up with this idea we're going to use this design toolbox, and it was going to be written in this Python, which is coding language. Each one of these elements in the design is basically going to be written as an object, object oriented programming. Each one of these objects is then going to be fed into the design. 
the design toolbox, you basically put in the parameters that you want, it would then iterate over all of these things as many times as necessary and spit out the rocket at the bottom. That way we're all integrated together and the design iteration is So that was the idea anyway. So I unfortunately don't have time to talk about all the kind of really cool engineering stuff, but I guess to talk about the engine uh, itself, so I'll, I'll just basically describe it. This is what we started to work with in the preliminary and critical design phases of the project. It looks cool, but most aerospace things do. Thankfully, the, you know, the reason why it looks cool is because it's functional. It's actually incorporating in you know, each of the design elements the spike geometry that just comes from the aerodynamic profile. This kind of barrel shape here that just comes from you know, the combustion chamber size and how much cooling you have around the edges. The plumbing in the back, so one, two, three, they're the um, uh, oxygen, that's where the oxygen is pumped in. And uh, the, the larger ones here, they are the fuel, so that they were just designed, you know, how much, you know, what, you know, what, are the, what are the physics behind the jets that you need to be able to mix your fuel properly and all that sort of stuff. So it literally just came from the design, you know, and the three, three structures here that just came from the, from the solids. The engine itself, it comes in basically two pieces. I like to call it a single piece design. All right, <coughs> I guess one piece uh, is the body, one piece is the spike, and the other piece is the lock nut. Now, a lock nut is just machined. Uh, the spike basically inserts, it's held in place by these three fins, it crushes against a copper collar up here, and then basically that nut is then screwed on that holds the whole assembly together. Um, in terms of what actually goes on inside, the blue area is here that's cooling, so water, water is pumped down the back here, it goes down the end, it turns around, it goes down this very fine jacket. Absolutely no way to make this traditional. The water is again pumped in the, this, in the jacket here, and that's pumped down the fins, but also you might be able to see it's pumped down this jacket as well. Fuel is pumped in here in this, uh, this annulus, and the annulus is rotated all around, you're just looking at the slice. Uh, green, that means where the oxygen is pumped in, so it's pumped in here, it's also remaining to here. Uh, we basically had fuel on the outsides, oxygen down the centre, gives you some sort of film cooling so the combustion doesn't happen right against the wall and melt your rocket. Um, we also had two uh, injector ports. Uh, which is basically a pilot light to, to start the engine. We're basically spraying fuel, spraying uh, gas consumption very gently, have a spark plug there that would light in a small chamber and then produce you know, a nice steady flame where we could open the main flow valves. That's uh, it for the engine. Um, we also designed, amongst other things, the test stand, the trailer. So basically, the large thing here, that's the cooling reservoir. We have a pump on the side that would just pump out water, pump it through the rocket, and be recycled with that. We measure all the temperatures, all the pressures, all that sort of stuff associated with the water. We had a blast shield at the front, we measured how, uh, how large put any uh, shrapnel fragments make it through, that sort of thing. Uh, and then it's, the engine itself is mounted on this cantilever frame. Now, engineers have a device called a strain gauge, and what a strain gauge is able to do is measure almost truly infinitesimal uh, amounts of stretch. So basically, <coughs> imagine if you have you know, a rocket pointing this way, let's, let's have that one. A rocket pointing this way, and it's thrusting, it's str even, even in a tiny amount, the flame will flex back a little bit. The flexing back produces a stretch on this side on the front of the thing. So we're actually able to measure that stretch, and that's uh, when we are able to cal calibrate that, we can calibrate that actually to get out the force. So that's how we're measuring force, just purely from the stretch of this frame. Uh, but yeah, we, we did it on an 8x6, uh, 8x6 trailer. Of course, that's not the only thing that was involved in the project. You need to design the toolbox, you need to do the control design, you need to do the safety documentation, the procurement stuff, the project management, and of course the design meetings. But nevertheless, um, this is what we started with, you know, a preliminary design, one person doing one thing and basically collaborating that way. By the end of it, everyone was essentially doing everything. Um, you know, we had this kind of mantra, you know, code, evaluate, data sheets, repeat, and that worked really well in our, in our, in our project. Basically, we, you know, I, would, I was working on the plumbing, uh, the propeller plumbing, I would go away and look at some of the valves and regulators, and I'd work out, okay, they had a diameter of this, you know, and then I'd go back to the coding base and look it up, and you know, go and change the cooling, or go and change some other, Grammar and give me instant feedback, and that, that worked really well in that room. So at that point, we were ready to show, uh, come back to Amero with our design, and we showed them this. Uh, we had, you know, numbers and tables and you know, reports and all that sort of stuff, but you know, we read in something nice and shiny that they'd be able to actually look at and see, okay, that's what it looks like, that's what we're going to print. I have no idea if they knew what they were looking at at this point, but they were excited, and we said, can we print it? And they said, absolutely. So, here's what it actually looked like. This is, this is the wow. thing being printed itself. Um, now, you have to remember the SLM, that is that simply slightly laser melting process, uh, the bed actually moves down, so it doesn't build up like a normal 3D printing process. Basically, what's happening is the hopper comes over a new layer, the bed moves down, pop a new layer, down, 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 down. So, here you can see on the right hand side, that's, that's what it looks like in, in printing. 
At the same time, we were working like absolutely crazy to make this trailer thing happen. Uh, we had, you know, we, we spent you know, a couple of weekends while in the whole frame together. We put the motor mount on. We worked on the individual systems, the strain gauge, the, the valves, the control, some of the propellant posing over here. Was this done at 2 a.m.? You bet it was. Uh, but you know, while, while we worked well, while we were doing that over here, we were busy, you know, the engine was busy getting printed, and, and here's what it actually looked like as soon as it comes out of the machine. It has this support structure here, which you know um, supports kind of like the overhangs that something you need for, for additive manufacturing. The spike is printed right next to it here. Um, the spike has these four machining holes, and that's basically you put in a four jaw chuck on a CNC lathe. Uh, and then the surface of this needs to be you know, quite smooth for aerodynamics. It, it, you know, it, it needs to be smooth. Uh, so that was, that was machined. Um, now we have a version of that at the back, which normally will kind of pass around. That is a second spike. Now, the reason why we have a second spike is because this build plate was slightly thicker than we originally anticipated. And it kind of just went, you know, didn't get noticed at that point. You can imagine that we're using up the absolute maximum domain of the build volume. It went all the way to the top, and this is that spike. It went all the way to the top, and then, it, you know, because this was, you know, say a centimeter too too thick, the machine stopped. So you can see on the top of that spike right there, uh, it hasn't completed the, the printing all the way top, and you can see some of those cooling channels uh, in there. So it's kind of actually a cool colorway. And the reason why that's all shiny is they've been machined. So the, the real spike is in the engine there. That's just the, the demo spike. Uh, they had actually the, the metal we're using is called Hastavoy X. It's a it's a super nickel alloy. Um, a nickel super alloy, it's extremely, extremely hard. It can just strip us, you know, a high speed steel tap like that. Um, and they wanted basically a practice go. Uh, so we gave them our spike and said, Yeah, it's a practice go. Okay, the testing phase, the exciting part. Okay, we were working towards, um, we were working towards, uh, you know, a hot fire. That is the big test we show them on, you know, the PR of the, of the project. We're working towards uh, basically making, you know, doing this demonstration for this rocket in front of about 70 people, in front of the press, in front of the stakeholders of the project. You know, we had to go and practice. So practice we did. We basically took it to my farm, which is just outside of Kyneton, um, and we found a very large paddock. It's about a thousand acres. We found a very large paddock, uh, and we were just setting up the testing there. At this stage, we didn't have we didn't have a half-hour component, but we had enough to sort of make a rocket work. So we were sort of just going up there to sort of iterate uh, on figuring out how we actually should make this thing function. We didn't have our um, compressed natural gas, we didn't have oxygen, we didn't have uh, the pressure regulators. What we were going to do is essentially go up to the farm and you know test out some of the systems. So here is a photo from the very first test. Now this is sort of late, late April at this point. You'll notice that uh, the flame is not actually inside the engine. Now the reason for that is we're using, we had to instead cobble together oxidizers and fuels. What we used was compressed air. We basically got you know, five air compressors that you would get from super cheap water. We plumbed them all together and said, there's an oxidizer. Uh, and on the fuel side, we basically got seven uh, LPG gas bottles, like barbecue bottles. And we, had, we had no ability to regulate the flow. We literally had just you know, valves on off. And when you have no ability to regulate the flow, that's what happens. You basically have no control over your mixture ratio, and the combustion happens outside the engine. It made about a five metre Bunsen burner flame. Tremendously spectacular. But, you know, a rocket was not. Thrust. Absolutely no thrust. Well, I mean, that's useless for a rocket, right? Um, two weeks later, the pressure regulators turned up. Finally, we had some gaseous oxygen. We hooked that up, and, you know, wow, look at the, look at the change. We're still using the propane at this point, but we didn't have the compressed natural gas. That was going to turn up on the hot fire, so, you know, we had to sort of just. Uh, get this working. Basically, what's happening here is the trailer's sitting by itself, with these gas bottles in front of that. That's all plumbed together. It's all com controlled completely remotely. Um, we're sitting about 200, what, 200 meters away, and we have a, a radio link, and uh, Dominic Tan is the man behind the keyboard making the thing work. From there, we were then going into a hot fire. So we had basically two practice runs before we you know, were demonstrating this thing working in front of um, you know, 70 people and the news crews and all that sort of stuff. This is a photo from our hot fire. And although it looks really successful, for us it was an abysmal failure. Uh, about 80% of our components broke. Things that we didn't even think could break, broke. Uh, but you know what, we had that much redundancy in the system that we're able to hobble something together and produce something. You can see the flame is much clearer now. We're using meat, uh, sorry, compressed natural gas, which is that 94% methane. So once we had the mixture ratio right, the flame should go you know, quite clear. Yes, yeah, you can see some of the shock diamonds uh, or the shock, shock, um, shock cells in the actual flow, and that's indicating that it is supersonic. 
Um, yeah, that's what it looks like. We went away, uh, you know, we were completely defeated. Uh, we basically, you know, I mean, the audience clapped and they thought it was fun to look at, but for us, you know, that was, that's a toy, that's, that's a baby rocket. Um, we went away and about two weeks later, we said we came out with an absolute vengeance. We fixed every component to make sure that we're not going to break, we bought the best of everything, and we produced this. And this is, you know, it only was a little bit better, it's now blue, the mixture ratio is even closer to right, um, and the pressure ratio is about five times higher. So that means that we're pumping in about five times as much fuel. Um, that's about as hard as you can go to get it to run. Um, in this case, uh, we're using, yeah, our, you know, basically dribbling, this is the engine on idle essentially, um, and we were able to measure the thrust at about 60 kilograms. Yeah, we were aiming for 300, it wasn't that much. On this side, oh, the thrust measurement broke. On the final day when we could run the engine, we had no idea how much thrust we were producing. Through some other sensors, we're actually kind of able to back it out a little bit, and we think probably around 150 kilograms uh, of force, uh, but you know, that's, that's sort of just messed it. Um, now, you need to be careful that the next video is quick. Uh, this is the video you may have seen. Oh, sorry, I skipped it. Sorry about that. Let me just. There we go. Alright, now we have to that this. Hopefully. There we go. This is the engine. Uh, that's the ignition. Now that's, that's the actual engine running. Now we basically stepped it up. We didn't go for 60 seconds at the start. We basically went for 5 seconds, 10 seconds, 15 seconds. And once we were happy, the engine was, was you know, not melting in the process and the fluid system was doing its job. We said, okay, we don't have a thrust measure, but we know we can demonstrate this thing running for a whole minute. And that proves that, you know, clearly it can run in a steady state. So that's what we did. So this is the, that's the video you might have seen on the news. Uh, I've got one more video which gives you kind of like a, you know, a, a perspective of what it was like to be there, to stand there and have the test site. It does have a few bad words in it, because it was an exciting time, uh, and it was just like there is. So we're about 400 metres away, the engine is down there. Man. So that's about 400 metres away, and you can hear this is being filmed on someone's phone. The microphone is actually clicking at 400 meters. Can you imagine what the people of the uh, of people at the people of Clinton must have thought this weekend? What the bloody heck is that? Uh, but yeah, it was in you know, But that, that's it. That's what it was like. You know, we were really tense the whole time. We had no idea if the thing was going to last or you know, it was going to work. That sort of thing. Uh, yeah. So, where to for the group from here? Uh, well, we're going to the IAC uh, next week to basically present, present the work, present their collaboration, present the technology, demonstrate or present something forward. We formed a group called Next Aero, and Next Aero is essentially, you know, it was originally something just to give the group, you know, an identity to, to sort of solidify exactly what that PhD students are amongst all the stakeholders. But since then, you know, it's really grown to be something so much larger than that. And we're now, you know, taking it forward and you know, working on this as kind of like, Maybe a startup, maybe, maybe something we can actually take forward. But for the moment, you know, it was originally designed to, to show um, rocket engines to the world, to show that in you know, Australia we have all the capability to do the space. We have the technology, we have the great universities, we have you know the narrow as in manufacturing that sort of thing. Uh, and what's more visual to do that than with a rocket engine? So we've got a next project, Project Next, it's just a placeholder. Uh, but we you know we've got that so far, and you know at this point we are looking for you know project partners. So. We look at Woodside, an oil and gas company. Uh, what are they doing making partnering with a rocket uh, group? Well, you know, although they are you know, not in the aerospace industry, you know, I've heard it say that you know you are the you are the, the average of the five people you spend most time with. Just being around, you know, additive manufacturing and being able to see the machines and being able to work with you know the groups and the PhD students and, and working in the labs and this stuff, you get so much benefit from just that sort of collaboration. So I think uh, with that, I'll say thanks very much uh, for, for giving me a chance to talk and promote our project and that sort of thing. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. That is the actual engine. Uh, we have the spike floating around, and there's also a uh, 3D printed cutaway to help you to visualize what, what's going on. Um, yeah, we formed Next Aero, so you can go to nextaero.com.au and look us up, or otherwise, uh, just, just drop us an email. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much.
Good kind of questions. Um, excellent. How long is the manufacturing process in Australia been for that? And the second question is, is that a patented design? Is it a unique design or is it like yeah. off the shelf? Um, okay, so number one, how long did it take to print? It took about eight days. And we've got a couple of the, you know, we've been running the machine continuously, so it's currently making more at, the, at this point. Uh, is it a patent design? It's not a patent design. You can make it. I've shown you the geometry. Um, uh, it's a gaseous motor. It, you know, it, it, has, it involves the physics that are required to make a gas motor work, so you need to change it substantially if you actually want to be able to use this motor. Um, and thirdly, you know, it's a it's, it's technology demonstrator. It's to show collaborate, collaboration between universities and the you know, advanced manufacturing capabilities. Um, so we actually want people to see what it looks like. I guess my question is, is, is it a unique design? Is it your yeah. original design that yeah. no one else has done before? Yeah, I mean, that, that's, that was part of it. We had to come up with a unique design. What's, yeah, I mean, I haven't seen, seen a couple of error spikes. I've seen them melt very quickly because you can't, yeah, if you make them traditionally, you can't cool them. Yeah. That's, that's a massive challenge. And does anyone have any questions? Like the mic if you have. And to try to point one of the back here, yeah, just to come through more clearly on the screen in the report. Thanks for a very good presentation. Um, I'm curious because it's essentially these are a, a, a number of PhD pieces that have been developed as part of this, and it ends at a certain point. Yeah. And you said you're trying to put together perhaps a startup or something mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. I'm interested more where you might be with that, yeah. and is there plans to take this to a you know a liquid propellant engine? Yeah. Have liquid oxygen and yeah. Some liquid fuel. Some liquid fuel, yeah. 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 Uh, believe it or not, this was done as an extracurricular activity. This was done outside of hours on the weekends. Uh, did it eat into our PhDs at any point? Absolutely. Uh, especially on the weekends before we you know a big, big test fire. Um, the group is really motivated. Uh, I think everyone wants to see space succeed in Australia and in Melbourne. Um, yeah, we're, we're hanging around. We want to make another engine. We've still got time left in our PhDs. We're going to fly under the radar. Uh, and do another one just sort of extra, extracurricularly. Um, but yeah the, yeah, the idea is to, you know, what we've been able to do is basically shrink, you know, an entire manufacturing facility with hundreds of master craftsmen in every particular thing and just shrink it down to a team of you know, engineers and a 3D printer. There was no one else involved. That was it. Um, and the next edition will be doses. No, we'll try the liquid fuel route, but we know, you know, now we've got actually something to demonstrate you know, the capability of the group. Uh, no. It's going to be difficult to, to actually do, number one, number two, it's going to be quite expensive. So, so you need two of our pumps as part of that process? I'm kind of, well, guess, yeah, I'm kind of keen to go for a more, and it's still a technology demonstrator um, sort of type thing, but now with liquid fuels and for the pressurisation of those fuels that we can use, um, like yeah, helium, yeah, yeah. yeah, which is gas pressurisation. Moves will need to do uh, turbo pumps and sort of fancy stuff, I guess. Uh, did you get a chance to actually, uh, uh, well, you didn't cut it up, so you couldn't analyse it in great detail, but the, the wear, uh, the tear on the, on yeah. the motor, yep. and, and how, what was the longest uh, thrust time that you had? Okay, um, now, the spike should actually come out, but when you crush it against a copper collar uh, and you apply the heat, the, the metal doesn't necessarily melt, but it deforms, it will change shape, and it basically gets stuck in there. Uh, so the spike, we, we could potentially press it out with a you know, very strong press, uh, but we think it could just damage the engine. Um, we've got a couple more that we're printing. We're going to do uh, a technique called um, electrodischarge machine, which is basically wire cutting but for metal. Uh, and we're going to cut away uh, an engine. We're probably going to leave that one as it is. Um, sorry, what was the last, the last question? Um, How long was the... Uh, oh, long was the was thrust time. Yes, we did the 60 second one, that was the last day of the last run, that's as long as we could possibly do it. I think the engine ran for about four minutes in total, uh, just cumulatively. Each time the engine completely came back uh, apart, it's a bit apart, so we used a bore scope to have a look inside and make sure that it was damaged. And then, why couldn't we run it long, do we? Um, okay. Uh, when we were, okay, because we have a gaseous uh, system, expanding that gas makes it very cold. Uh, when you were using just commercial gas components, we you know, had some of the 
most expensive hoses, just for diameter that you could actually buy for oxygen. Uh, and yeah, you're not supposed to use those below, I think, minus 10 degrees. When you expand gas, it gets very cold and, and you could potentially just shatter those hoses. Um, we could have run it for longer than a minute. I think we've been really pushing the gas system. When we came back, some of the valves were actually having trouble shutting. Uh, there was about three millimetres of ice on all the hoses, uh, on the regulators, on the bottles themselves. Um, but, you know, if, I think we've proven that it can run at steady state. So I think that was one of the, one of the objectives. So, my understanding is that uh, Rocket Labs and also SpaceX are doing 3D imaging. Right? Yeah. How, well, obviously, you know, aerospace, but how different or how unique is it? Yeah. So, Rocket Lab, I mean, they're the, they're the really cool ones, in my opinion. Um, they've got, yeah, they've got the, the larger one, which is actually kind of flown now. Um, the, you know, the electron is a bit like the Rutherford, Rutherford, that's it, the Rutherford engine. Um, yeah, that, that's done with a technique called the electron uh, beam melting. I believe, yeah, and that's sort of a different three different process. It produces a high level of roughness. Uh, I believe that's just a nozzle structure. It's some of the internal like regenerative coolants. That's where you pump the, the, the cryogenic liquids inside the, 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 the sheet, the, the rocket nozzle itself to cool it. Um, how does it compare? Yeah, I think, I think we're just starting to use 3D printing as a manufacturing to the rest of the shrink unit. The process will take you know, an extremely large manufacturing facility and you know, Tens of years of research and how to make the components and specify you know, the quality, quality assurance. I think we're starting to sort of look at, well, can we make you know, these cheap ranges of 3D printing? Um, so I think that's, that, that's probably their direction, uh, and I guess you we'll know, in, in our way out. Fantastic. Well, that's wonderful. Um, we've got a bit more going on, so we'll, we'll move on. Right. Thank you so that's much for that. Really appreciate you coming on to the session. We're going to keep you.
That reminds me of the one she did. Each end back of the back of the field. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Last time we had uh, former SAT out of Vandenberg and we had uh, CRS 12, that was the CRS 12 landing. Nice picture. Uh, commercial crew, uh, Boeing, not much to report, nothing's changed here since last month we spoke, which is a good sign. So next year could be the big year for all the uh, all these new rockets and uh, manned space flight and Starliners and uh, dragging, crew dragons. Commercial crew. Importantly, SpaceX will be the first to uh, to really try out its uh, man capsule. Uh, but what did come out over the last month was the new spacesuits uh, that Mr. Musk produced. Uh, very interesting, not like the uh, Boeing ones. Um, holy cow, what happened <laughs> Oh. Oh. <laughs> so Dark Raid is really Elon Musk. I didn't know that. <laughs> anyway, and there he is. And these were some prototypes that uh, they, they used. Uh, I kind of looked at that and looked at the seam in the middle to wonder whether it was uh, sealed or not. But anyway, I guess it, it has to be. And this is actually the walkway to the new white room, uh, which uh, the SpaceX white room. And uh, they'll be installing that on 39A. 
uh, before the year's out. So uh, it's ready to go. They've just got to finish off the... Uh, so that's going on the old fixed service tractor? Yep. Yep. That's how they get astronauts into their uh, Dragon crew dragon. General? Just um, a quick thing on that. There was a big controversy over the fact that they had to forward after the, uh, before the repellent was loaded. I don't know the story. I don't know the actual I, I have no idea, but I suspect they will not load uh, with the... Uh, they'll have the... They will have all finished loading before they put astronauts on. If they're super chilled... They may drop it because the requirement of getting into low Earth orbit is not quite as significant. So I reckon that's what will happen, yeah. uh, but I haven't heard any more. No. Uh, I guess the, uh, the interesting features out of this little table are all the black ones that have happened. Uh, we're just about on the verge of Falcon Heavy. Uh, they're just about ready to go on that, so we'll, uh, we'll look forward to that one. And then there's uh, CRS-13, um, will occur in December. And then there's an uncrewed Dragon to demo. And this is the one that goes up in February. Then there'll be a crewed Dragon flight aboard. It's probably uh, April sometime. Uh, and another Falcon Heavy will go up. So the next, there's a series of other launches in between. But what's the status of the propulsive landing? The, for the dra crewed Dragon? The dragon, dragon, crew dragon. dragon. That's killed. No. It's gone. No. It's gone. It'll only be used for launch board. Uh, this will be a suborbital mission, the abort test. Just go up and uh, get to maximum Q, and then I'll uh, let the uh, Dragon go off with its Dragos. And that's what the Dragos are really intended uh, to be for. Okay, moving on. Uh, now, in the meanwhile, this is a video that was produced by Elon Musk about how not to land an orbital rocket booster. This is pretty good, so. Uh, enjoy. The X-37B Orbital Test Vehicle, or OTB, is the nation's first unmanned space plane. 
Managed by the U.S. Air Force Rapid Capabilities Office, the Boeing-built X-37B is a highly flexible testbed platform for a variety of on-orbit demonstrations. This reusable system allows hosted experiments to be returned, inspected, modified, and flown again at dramatically reduced cost. The X-37B testbed platform is unique because we can tailor our emissions to specific user needs and return experiments back for post-flight inspection. The X-37B is designed to fly and test new technologies, reduce technical risk early in product design, and validate system performance. It has completed four successful flights accumulating over 2,000 days of on-orbit demonstrations. The vehicle provides experiments with power, data, commanding, thermal, and attitude control. The X-37B has repeatedly achieved rapid experiment integration timelines, proving itself to be a responsive test platform. Leveraging the existing X-37B infrastructure and reusing the platform allows users to focus their investment on the experiment and developing new technologies. The Air Force Research Laboratory Hall Effect Thruster Experiment highlights the value of this reusable space plane. This experiment, flown on OTV4, validated performance enhancements that could only be tested in a space environment. Utilizing the X-37B enabled this complex experiment to be flown in less than 24 months. OTV-5 continues to advance the performance and flexibility of the X-37B as a space technology demonstrator. Today's launch of OTV-5 is the first flight of an X-37B on a SpaceX Falcon 9. The ability to launch the X-37B on multiple platforms will provide responsive and assured access to space. Following the OTV-4 landing in Florida, the program is consolidating launch, recovery, refurbishment, and experiment integration in the repurposed orbiter processing facility. This consolidation reduces processing time and positions the program to be even more responsive. The reliability, reusability, and responsiveness of the X-37B will fundamentally change how we perform future space missions. The X-37B, flying tomorrow's technologies today. They had two. Yeah, two. Mm. Oh, okay. You're not made available to commercial use. No, so that's the last one we launched. And these are, believe it or not, they've had 16 landings. They're the 16. So, pretty amazing. Now, the structure, I, I'm always fascinated by this. I keep looking at the pictures. This was what it was like uh, probably a year ago. And February this year, uh, I don't know what month that is, but there, there it is probably, I'd say four weeks ago. I um, wouldn't be surprised if a lot of the hurricane helped do anything to it. But they've got to get back down and get uh, the, certainly the crewed uh, flights using that uh, tower. So I've got some parts of that, so I'll leave that here. <laughs> Oh, sorry, this is the latest. Have a look at that. <laughs> That's a big structure, I've got to tell you. But uh, there's not much left of it. And uh, back to landing zone one. In the red, this is, re you know, recent pictures. You saw them a month ago. But there you'll see a rocket. Obviously, a drone is taking a snapshot of the CO's 12 landing at landing zone one. And of course, we know landing zone two is being built. That is it. So they're going to uh, bring their launch Falcon Heavy. Two side boosters will land there, and the core will land on the barge. So, something to look forward to. Now the Vandenberg. Guess what? The uh, Vandenberg is just north of LA. The uh, SpaceX launch out of uh, Space uh, Complex 4. And lo and behold, they've got a landing zone here too. And there it is. That's looking at the rocket from the landing zone. And if you um, go to Google Earth, I think you can actually, well, I took that picture, but you can actually scan around it. Hey, just on the Falcon Heavy, that, that centre stage, does that run longer than the other two? Is it longer? Or the Don't know. You just throttle down. It runs longer, so it's a larger. No, it's just throttle no. down. No, they're probably oh, throttle down. down. No, they did. They, they scrapped that. They're not oh, doing okay. that anymore. Now. Yeah. What's that time? Uh, the, the original plan was to pump fuel from the outer two in the center booster. Oh, okay. But that's gone now. But, it's, uh, but they throttled. Someone said down the back. They throttled. They're going to throttle the center booster down. 
burn the other ones to full power, yeah. they'll separate. That's why the centre one's going to land down the ocean, because right. it's, it's all further down right. Further down right. Yeah. Okay. This is, uh, Len, this was a picture of uh, Blue Origin Factory. This is diagrammatic, but uh, a lot of it's moved ahead since. Um, this was probably about a month ago, uh, and just to be certain weatherproof by now. Uh, there's the picture that you showed me before. Uh, the visitor centre, as we discussed last time, is up that, that direction, and you've got the uh, Blue Origin there, and you've got the site for um, OneWeb, and that was OneWeb last month, and that's OneWeb recently. Probably a couple of weeks ago. So things are moving uh, rapidly down there. This is the Blue Origin rocket. Uh, you'll note that the first iteration had a 5.4 metre uh, fairing. Uh, that's the rocket, and they've announced they're not going to bother with the 5.4, they're going straight for the 7, seven metre fairing, and that's big. And you can see this. See the person to scale, I think they show it. There he is. So it's a big payload fairing. It can uh, bring a lot of satellites into orbit. And launching satellites with the satellite with the solar panels already deployed, right? <laughs> 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 yes, Peter. <Peter. laughs> so there you go. So that's uh, I'm not quite sure, but next year they'll probably try to launch that. Sierra Nevada, Dream Chaser, next year or the year after. And New Shepard will, uh, will be launching shortly too. Before the end of the year, they've got the, the booster component that's just been delivered to Texas. So, and it's a slightly modified one to the one that landed uh, the New Shepard uh, last month. So they'll be using that very shortly. This is Dream Chaser. This is, this is a captive carry uh, test that they did the other, the other week. see the wheels deployed but they did and that would be part of the testing. Make sure the wheels come down this time. All three of them. Uh, sorry, two wheels, one skin. So we should be able to see this uh, flying before the year's out. Well this was the manned version. This was actually part of the competition. It's still being funded by the original competition for crewed services to the space station. They lost that competition, but they've still got the uh, Dream Chaser um, under that particular contract. The new contract is for commercial resupply number two, which is a cargo to space station, and they're really getting uh, test data for that mission. They dropped it up. They dropped it. Eventually. No, they don't drop it. <laughs> no, they dropped it. They haven't done the flight yeah. just now. This was this was the aerodynamics. They went nearly. No, they haven't done the flight test. They dropped drop one and landed just last week. Not that I'm aware of. No, I don't know. This was this was the test the aerodynamics test that flew along the canal. Yes, right. I think that's right. Not for this No, they haven't flown it yet. Anyway, moving on. That's what. That they did the live stream, though, didn't they? That's the actual uh, uh, contract that they have with NASA to deliver cargo, both pressurised and non pressurised. But uh, the thing is, you, you don't get any greater G's than about two, two and a half. So this will be really gentle on the payloads. And it will actually deliver payloads virtually to the front door. Uh, so down cargo from uh, ISS will come down in this. Uh, uh, relatively quickly with uh, not much uh, 
what's it going up on? What project? That's going up on the Atlas, Atlas 5. But it's designed to go, you know, just, it, it'll fit into a fairy because the wings actually fold. You don't see it in this picture, but the wings fold and it'll fit in a, I don't know if it's a 7 metre or 5.4 metre fairy, but... Uh, Are it, they on an actual down fairy? No. No, it's not. They launch, it's concealed inside. Uh, the space launch system, liquid oxygen tank, has just come out of the um, machine plant in New Orleans. Uh, that will be part, I suspect, of uh, the exploration mission 1 in 2019. This one that picks the welding up? I think so. I think that's the one. They had trouble with welding, and I think that's the one that they fixed it on. This is actually the second of the Orion space capsules, and this will be in two, so that will have astronauts in it in 21, maybe 22. We, we don't know the actual date, but it will happen eventually. And they are obviously have been uh, uh, trying to get their parachute certified, so they're working through that. So, again, incremental steps, but they keep. Uh, I don't know if you want to see it, it's a very short video. Oh. That was the first launch out of the cave. That was Bumper. Um, they had launched previous V2s uh, at uh, in Arizona. Yeah, before this, but uh, this was the first launch out of the cave. And they used the painted scaffold as the uh, tower to get up to the to put the uh, little rocket on the top. Star Chaser. But Peter had a really nice picture, but this is a guy, um, one of these other you know, suborbital uh, visionaries who wants to take people into, uh, into suborbital flight, but he's uh, firing out of uh, in England. It's a 27 foot reusable sky bolt rocket. Steve Bennett is his name from Northumberland in the UK. Um, it actually, there it is, standing on the back of the trailer, and there it is going up. It got to about 1.5k. Oh, I, I don't get this, I keep seeing it. you know, vectors and these things, as I'll see, you know, Copenhagen suborbitals. These are all guys who are trying to capture some sort of market, but you know, would you put your life in their hands? Probably not. Um, this is, we've seen all this, but uh, I reckon the, I'm not going to show it again, but uh, the videos here are really good. I'll keep going, I'll go past this. Uh, moving on. A guide to Gale Crater. I picked this up, and this will be down Andrew's, uh, Andrew's line. Have you seen this one? No? Uh, I think so, yeah. This is uh, Curiosity. In 
which helps groundwater flow through and alter them again before they dry out. By about 3 billion years ago, we're left with the basic form we see today. And it's in this version of Gale Crater that Curiosity has helped piece together this world. Sediment patterns show a lot of water was present continually over many millions of years, both as persistent groundwater and a long-standing lake with occasional dry spells. Mineral and chemical readings show that water from both the lake and subsurface was friendly for potential microbes. Drill samples from the lake bed show key elements, organic molecules, nutrients, and energy sources that microbes could have used. Water flowing through underground fractures could have supported life even in deeply buried rocks. And the composition of sun layers makes them good for preserving potential signs of past life. Taken together, the evidence points to Dale Crater and Mars in general as a place where life, if it ever arose, might have survived for some time. With our primary mission fulfilled, we continue exploring, uncovering the history of Mars, and learning more about how and where future missions can search for the signatures of ancient life may have left behind. So, the question is based on the knowledge that they've got out of Gale Crater, are they likely to go back to Andrew, do you think, as a mission to actually extend that? Uh... Uh, everywhere that they've been, you want to go back to my field investigations, particularly Gale Crater, because although Curiosity has done a lot of things, it's still got a lot more to do. Mm. It just and, seemed to me, I heard a report. At the moment, it's climbing down and climbing Mount Sharp. Mm. And it's investigating a particularly interesting ridge. Uh, Just a couple of others. There you are. This is a future mission to Mars. Uh, 55 years ago, Mr. Kennedy at Rice University made a bit of an announcement uh, that really puts on track to, I guess, most of us being here tonight. Interesting, uh, interesting story. Uh, now, mast and space systems, 3D engine. Uh, this is made in three parts. You guys, two parts. <laughs> but there's a three-part engine, and Marston is involved with NASA um, on a uh, basically a uh, venture with NASA to find ways of landing cargo on Mars, but uh, on the moon. However, uh, NASA is about to announce. Uh, uh, a COTS program, for want of a better word, for moon initiative to actually land payload. Uh, these guys will be involved, Blue Origin will be involved, and there's a couple of other companies. I just like this because it's a good picture, but uh, the European Extremely Large Telescope, I mean, this thing apparently, Len, you might be able to tell us, uh, we'll be able to see, uh, you know, exoplanets uh, around, you know, the atmospheres and all the rest of it. Yeah, I hope so. But it's an amazing size, and these are comparisons. I couldn't believe it. There's the old polymer single mirror, I think, admittedly, but that's the 200 inch. This thing is the size of a. Um, group. Even the one down in the left hand corner has got a better chance. Which one? This one? Yeah. Really? James Webb? Yeah. Without the atmosphere. Well, this is uh, something to look forward to in 2022, I think. Uh, this was how fast a rocket would have to go to leave every planet. And, uh, you know, I was just thinking to myself that if the Earth had been a little bit bigger, 1.5 times its size, we would start to have difficulty getting off the ground. Uh, could do it, but it starts to become problematic. Maybe we could even do now. Thanks, Len. <laughs> so. You want to make it harder? <laughs> But I just realised that uh, you know you have to uh, to be a space venturing species, you have to be on the right size planet as well as being in the Goldilocks zone, as well as a whole million other um, variables to dictate uh, the um, intelligent life. So, okay, Cassini. Um, I don't know if you want to see this. Where's what happened, Andrew? Where is Andrew? Where is he? I'm here. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I can show it. This is good. This is, uh, anyway, it's worth watching. Yeah, it's, uh, this is the last part of the Cassini talk. It's been colorized, of course, but uh, this is a good, good video. Yeah. Yeah, 
two minutes. Two minutes. Uh, we're going to be out of here in about 15 minutes. We'll be out of here for Well, Andrew's just out of here. Oh, Jesus. Yeah. Oh. Hang on. It's actually worth seven. Jobs, uh, you know, at the end of his presentations, he'd say, and one more thing. And today, I collected a whole lot of the one more things that I had left over for pretty much every month this year, and I put them into a package. We're only going to show one little last thing tonight, and the others, well, next month, the month after, next year, who knows? <laughs> anyway, um, Michael. You've got that up there? Cassini. Every few days I've been going out and looking up almost exactly overhead and Saturn has been moving through the constellation, the Scorpio, the big question mark in the sky. And I resolved that the night that Cassini finished its mission. I would go out at the real time, okay, forget Einstein, and the light travel time, when Cassini was going into Saturn, and I'd look at Saturn and I'd say, oh, my name is burning up. Well, what happened on Friday night? The sky was crying. The sky was crying because Cassini was finishing up. So it wasn't until the next night I went out and I said, Ah, oh, yes, it's happened in between the clouds. And, oh, my name is gone. The Cassini spacecraft is gone. And then the, the night after that, good clear sky and you could see. So if you want to see Saturn, go out, look for the scorpion in the sky in the early evenings, you know, about 8 o'clock, 9 o'clock. It's almost exactly overhead. Look at that question mark in the sky, and the one slightly to the north of it that looks like a bright star, that is Saturn. Okay, are we ready? It's interesting to know that the day that Cassini died is the anniversary of the day that Cassini died. Ah. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't realise that. Within 24 hours. We wouldn't allow for a lot of trouble time. Um, I can't see that. Is that true? He died on the Cassini boom from 400 years ago. He died on the 14th of September. Oh, shit. Yeah. Okay. Right, folks. I'll just yeah. click on that. Well, I mean, they had, they had a control over the... But... Um, on the uh, space show, I played... Last week, um, goodbye, Cassini. Your mission speedy. Bravo, Cassini. Our sounding wing. You showed us Saturn's rings and lots of pretty things. Huygens probe took a dive early 2005. Landed on Titan. It was exciting. Your mission over. Failed to surprise. Dazzled our eyes. No. Eyes. 
Now that guy there played the emergency hologram on a television series called Star Trek. Okay, right. Anyway, as I was about to say, to introduce that, on last week's The Space Show, I had Linda Spurlka, um from a recording at uh, the lecture she gave at JPL, talking about the science and what it had achieved. And I'd like to play a little tune or something, you know, a song relevant on The Space Show. And there are very few things about the Cassini mission, and I've played them all, and very little about Saturn. So I thought, oh, what am I going to do? Well, we're supposed to do Australian content on the show, we can. And so I came up with the sound of silence. Do you know a singer called Dami Im? Yeah. And a television network called Eurovision and the Song Contest? Well, she sang the sound of silence on that. And so that's what we now have. You go listening for Cassini, the sound of silence. So I played that as a sort of a joke. This song, I found afterwards, I only found it out on the weekend, and so it's going to be on Wednesday's The Space Show, provided Jay uh, DMC play it. Okay, so I guess we're out of time here. So look, that's it for, for the meeting tonight. Um, we to help out and uh, see what the of these so we're joking out of these and the Navy, man. But anyway, um, we're back here October 22, I believe.